September and October 2008 are eventful months in Sri Lanka, with developments on the war front making an impact beyond our borders. Indian politicians too took protest action against the worsening humanitarian situation in the Vanni, prompting Sri Lankan leaders to engage with their Indian counterparts. To find out more about this and other actions, Tarika spoke to S. Balakrishnan. Hello, Mr. Balakrishnan. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, there is heightened war in the north and uh, the government forces are said to be very close to defeating the LTTE. Now against such a backdrop, the president recently convened the all-party conference to discuss a political solution to the conflict. Uh, what do you think is the government's strategy to end this conflict? When you look at the political, the all-party conference, unfortunately it's not all-party. The two major and the decisive parties, the United National Party and the uh, Tamil National Alliance did not participate in this conference. Basically, reason is, first of all, we have throughout since independence, the politics of adversary then politics of coexistence. The inter-party adversaries or ideological conflict is more rooted than any form of coexistence that's been attempted to develop. And uh, therefore, the government did not prepare the background in, 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 a, in a manner where all the parties can confidently and conveniently participate in a discussion of an all-party mechanism. This is really problem. The second aspect is, uh, when you talk about the all-party conference regarding the ethnic conflict, we carry a lot of frustration because none of the all-party conference that ever held in this country throughout the history, especially since late 70s, failed to deliver anything substantial. You see, and it's always a frustration or betrayal for one party or another party. And therefore, uh, the, the all-party conference need to be uh, strategized in such a way to create confidence and a strategy that will that will deliver the progress. Okay. Um, meanwhile, there have been rumblings from India over the Sri Lankan government's stance on finding a military solution to the conflict. Uh, how much leverage, if any, do you think India can have on Sri Lanka in this context? Well, uh, India is a very decisive factor in this country and I believe still India remains as part of the problem. India had never been a part of solution. During Indira Gandhi's period, India made some sort of attempt to, to pressurize the government to bring a political solution to the conflict, but unfortunately Indira Gandhi's uh, assassination and the Rajiv's arrival and things have changed drastically in other way. Uh, but uh, one is to understand India has a two major interests in Sri Lanka. One is India is intolerant to allow the neighbors to act in detrimental to the geopolitical aspiration of India, including its own internal security. And therefore, India wanted all their neighbors under some form of control. This is their own uh, the kind of a foreign policy for South Asia adopted immediately after the independence. Second, India also at the same time did not want a Sri Lankan issue to become an internal issue because of Tamil problem here and more than 50 million Tamils living in India and they are sort of a, you know, cultural ties and ethnic ties and then that not to allow that to be exploited by the Indian Tamils in order to create an internal problem for India, you know. So this is the kind of a situation that India is in. So India cannot ignore the internal uprising in order to create a problem for themselves. The other side, India cannot effort Sri Lanka to be isolated or pressurized to the extent that they go with other countries which India considers hostile to India to link up and build relationship. So this is the kind of a dilemma that India is in. Finally, what do you think needs to be done to improve the present situation uh, and move towards a time where there is no conflict and no war? The government must prepare a common mechanism and try to generate the support of all the political parties, at least in the parliament, because you need two-thirds ready support is very important. And the southern consensus 
is very important to convince any tunnels or LTT or others that the South is now committed to take, a, uh, take forward the uh, peace process. Because if you look at the past, when one party negotiates, ruling party, the major opposition opposed it and toppled it. This has been the story of this peacemaking. Uh, third is, the government have to come up with the southern consensus, a proposal identifying and addressing the legitimate democratic grievances of the Tamil people. That includes also how they are going to address the post-conflict era. It's very important. And with this kind of a preparation, the government also have to ensure the rule of law, very importantly, and uh, good governance. These are some of the essentials that needs to be guaranteed before starting a process that can address the issues underlying the armed conflict and the ethnic conflict. It was a pleasure talking with you, Mr. Balakrishnan. Thanks for sharing your insight. Thank you very much. Thank you.